morning, church. It is great to be together on this Pentecost Sunday. That is why we were wearing red as we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Uh, As we are gathered together in worship, let us be gathered with these words of the psalmist. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, you his servants. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore. Sisters and brothers, let us praise our Lord. seated, please join your hearts with mine as we confess our sins to our loving and faithful God. Let us pray. With new life all about us, O God. Friends, the Lord's mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. In the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven.
It's good to have you here and worship today at First Presbyterian Norfolk. If you haven't already done so, I encourage you to fill out your connection card on the back of which is a place for you to list your prayer requests. If you mark confidential, only the pastoral staff will see those, but a number of people, including our prayer team, will be praying for you and for your needs during this week. If you're watching online, there's a connection above the live link that you can fill out your connection card, your prayer request, and the staff will receive that today. There's a lot of great things happening at First Pres in Norfolk. I encourage you to take the time to look at our website that you might find a place to plug in and serve others. One of the great things that's happening is the Summer Book Club, the Relentless Elimination of Hurry. If you hurry, you got it, yeah. You might be able to sign up today as the last day. The books are in the common area, $15, and we have study groups throughout the week during Sunday morning. Uh, it's a good read and an easy read, and it's something that is convicting and yet encouraging at the same time. Lastly, I want to mention the Massonetta Family Mission Trip, August 8 through 11. Uh, this is an opportunity for you to join your church at Massonetta Springs Camp and Conference Center in Harrisonburg, Virginia. Uh, information and registration packets are available, uh, not only physically here, but also online. Check the box on the back of the connection card if you'd like more information, and we'll push that information to you. Worship, fellowship, service are all uh, integral to that experience and all ages are welcome. Kristen Rand, do you want to share us some information about the prayer luncheon today? John Wesley said that God does nothing except an answer to prayer. My friends, we need revival in our homes, in our communities, in our families and in our own hearts. So today the prayer team is sponsoring a luncheon and prayer time at 1215. There's enough lunch if everybody in the whole congregation wants to come. It's soup, it's just very simple. Um, I know this can be intimidating for you all to pray for revival, but we have pattern prayers. We have scripture for you to pray. You can pray as the spirit leads. But I do believe that God will answer our prayers, and he'll bring revival, much needed revival, to a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So please come today at 1215, lunch is provided, and uh, it'll just be for maybe an hour and a half or so. So please come, thanks. Thanks, Kristen. Let's take a few moments to stand and greet those around us. See you up and around, Elizabeth. No fainting today, right? Good. I know. I know. Scary stuff. Oliver can't carry the children's sermon every week. Um, one week, he got his candy bar. Yes. So um, I am glad that you're here, and I am glad that it is almost summertime. And today is a very important day in the life of our church. It is actually the birthday of the Christian church. So it is a holiday that we call in our church family Pentecost, and Penta means. 50, that's a big number, even I'm not that old yet. I'm almost that old. Um, 
hold on, Bo. Um, we're going to make this quick, folks. Um, let me back up. So, um, Penta means 50, and Jesus, remember on Easter, he died on the cross, but he did not stay dead. What happened to him after he died? Do you know, Bo? He rose up to heaven. He did. He rose from the dead, and he lived on earth with his disciples and a meeting and talking to them for 40 days. And then 10 days after Jesus went up into heaven, which we call ascension, which is when he went up into the heaven after he was rose from the dead, um, something happened. So all of his disciples were hidden in a room and Jerusalem, which um, was the main part of Israel, where all of people from all over the place came for a special celebration. Um, so Jerusalem was so busy at the time. But all of the disciples were scared because Jesus had just been killed for being a Christian, right? And their Savior had gone up into heaven and they were left all alone. But before he left and went up into heaven, Jesus gave his people a promise. So 10 days after he left them, something big happened, which is something you probably only see in a movie. The winds came and fire came down like flaming tongues. What do you think happened, Bo? Um, it, it got on Jesus' head. It got on his disciples' head. That's exactly right. But the Holy Spirit, which is Jesus in our hearts, came down and filled all of their hearts. And it's the celebration of the birthday because that's when all the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they started going out and spreading the good news to all kinds of people speaking different languages. And it was such a big day, right? But the Holy Spirit doesn't have to ha just live in the disciple's heart. The Holy Spirit can live in our heart when we accept him as our Savior, too. So we are going to go to Children's Church in just a minute, and we are going to go celebrate and learn about Pentecost, which is um, the day that we celebrate the church birthday. So, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, Lord, and thank you for the privilege that we have to be church family, and thank you that you sent your son down to be crucified and risen, Lord, and thank you for um, the gift that he has given to us to send the Holy Spirit to live in our life, Lord, so that we are not alone and we always feel your presence. In your heavenly name, amen. All right, hold on, we're going to go out this, we're going to go out this way. Pentecost Sunday, and as we learned in our children's sermon, uh, Pentecost is uh, kind of considered the birthday or the foundation of the Christian church, and if you've grown up in the church, uh, then you know that usually on this Sunday we read a particular passage, the account of the Holy Spirit coming on Pentecost. So I invite you to join me and follow along in Acts chapter 2 as we read this morning uh, this, this wonderful account of the coming of the Holy Spirit, picking up in verse 1. Listen for the word of our Lord. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one of them heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't these all Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus in Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonder of God in our own tongues. 
Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, What does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, They've had too much wine. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So as we uh, look at this encounter at Pentecost, as I mentioned, um, growing up in the church, uh, every year on this particular Sunday, we read the same passage. And um, there's, some, there's always some new um, truth or something new that's revealed in this each time that I, I come to this passage. And so um, this year in particular, in this season, um, there's a question that I want you to consider for yourself as we read and as we consider Pentecost. And the question is this, are you a good waiter? Not like a, in a restaurant or in serving food, although it's good to be a, a good servant, but are you good at waiting? Are you a patient person? Looking at yourself and your personality, if you had to rate yourself, where would you put your, your skills in waiting on a scale of one to 10? How patient are you? A follow-up question to that you might want to ask yourself is, how honest am I? Um, <laughs> and then re-ask the question, how patient? But I, I would assume, I would imagine that wherever you place yourself on that scale, that there's some work that can be done. Um, that patience is probably one of those things that none of us have perfected and all figured out, I would imagine. Uh, I will confess before you this morning that I am terrible at waiting. I have uh, horrible patience. I get frustrated. I just, I, I want to go. I want to get it done. I want to jump in there. Um, there's a reason, I think, that when Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians, that he mentions patience. I believe he mentions it because there's nothing within us as people, as humans, that we naturally are patient people. I think it's something that we struggle with, and it's something we rely on the Spirit to give us, to be patient. So as I was reflecting on my own struggle with patience, I realized that there's a number of ways that we deal with these seasons in which we find ourselves waiting, when we need to be a patient people. Um, one experience in particular that came to mind this, this past week, um, in 2008, I was on deployment on the USS Theodore Roosevelt. It's an aircraft carrier. And on an aircraft carrier, if you've never been on one, there's a, a hangar bay, which is the interior part of the ship, but it's a big, massive, open space. It's where all the maintenance gets done on the planes, and it's just wide open and a high ceiling. And in the hangar bay, at the very back, towards the aft end of the ship, there's a workspace that has a door, a hatch, uh, we don't have doors on ships, uh, but has an opening that people can get out of. And there's like sort of a balcony chained off area, but it's accessible uh, from this one particular space. So as we were on deployment in 2008, the people that worked up there had the, the bright idea to help everybody out on the ship in knowing how much time was left, and they created this big billboard countdown clock sort of thing for the days remaining on deployment. So they made these big, huge numbers, and they put them up on the wall in the corner of the hangar bay and started counting down the days until we were scheduled to return. Fortunately, we actually returned on the day we were scheduled to, which doesn't happen very often, but I, in particular, um, remember those numbers changing. So as I was on deployment, I worked overnight, so 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. And we would start our shift working, and it would be one number, and at some point, the number would change. And we had the, the pleasure of seeing it go from 100 to 99, and thinking, all right, we're in the double digits now. We can do this. We just got to hang in there. And seeing it get to 60, and thinking, all right, two months, we can do that, 30. And then the day came when we started work and it said 10, and at some point it went to nine. And I remember the feeling of looking up and saying, all right, single digit days, we've got this. And then it went to seven, and then eventually to one, and eventually we came home and uh, had this great reunion with our families. It's sort of similar to uh, if you've got kids or maybe you yourself have a little chocolate advent calendar as you count down the days towards Christmas each day, you open and take a chocolate. There's ways in which we, we cope and we, we manage this waiting. There's different types of waiting as well. There's, there's waiting in which we know the timeline and we know the event that's to come. So on deployment, for example, we knew how many days we had left and we had a sense of what that day would be when it arrived. 
these great stories of homecoming, running across the parking lot at the pier and reuniting with our families. Same as a holiday, we count down to Christmas, knowing the joy and anticipation of, of that day when it does finally arrive. But there's other types of waiting. There's other seasons in which we know the event that's to come, but we don't know when. We know that somebody has promised to do something for us, but not set a timeline, so we're just kind of waiting until it happens. And then there's a third type of waiting. There's a season of waiting in which we don't know the outcome or what to expect or the event that is coming. And we also don't know the timeline. These are the seasons of going in and having some medical tests done and then waiting for the phone call with the results. Not knowing when that phone's gonna ring and also not knowing what the report is gonna be when that call finally does come. But in all of these seasons, we find different ways to cope, to manage, to, to deal with our expectations. So whether it's a countdown on the wall of a hangar bay, or it's an advent calendar, or a paper chain that kids often make counting down days till the end of school, we find these ways to cope, to get through, to manage, to, to deal with this anticipation. And very often, uh, to be honest, I tend to do this myself, we start to, to picture that day to run through the scenarios in our mind. So as we're waiting for that day to come, we start thinking, well, what if this happens? What will it be like? We, we practice the conversations in our mind over and over and over again. And we start to anticipate. And then we start to set expectations for that day and then to manage the expectations and to say, well, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. But all this serves to do is to turn inward to start to shut off the outside world in our waiting and start to look inward towards our own anxious thoughts and building these expectations and managing our expectations. I hesitate to mention this, but I think we're all aware that um, this is a presidential election year. If you weren't aware of that, it is. Uh, so we're all in the season of waiting, of knowing that something's gonna happen in November, but we don't know what. And so in our mind, we start to think about, well, what if this happens, and then what, and then what? And the temptation, again, is to turn inward. So whether it's our social lives, our political lives, our personal lives, our health, in these seasons of waiting, the great temptation for us is to turn inward, to isolate, to cope, and, and to try to manage our expectations. The reason I mention all this this morning is, as our uh, children pointed out to us, as Hunter mentioned, the apostles on Pentecost are in a season of waiting. Like I said, growing up in the church, every Pentecost Sunday, we read this text. And so often in my experience, it's been Easter and then a few weeks of, uh, of a sermon series or some things happen. And all of a sudden it's Pentecost and we read this text, we have uh, worship and then we move on. But it's important to remember what actually is happening on Pentecost and to look at the situation the apostles find themselves in. So Pentecost does mean 50. It's the 50th day. And it's a Jewish festival that actually occurs on this day called Shavuot. It's the festival of weeks, or the celebration of the harvest. And it's called the festival of weeks because it's essentially a week of weeks. So how many days are in a week? Seven, not a trick question. Um, so if you have one week worth of weeks, you have seven sevens. You have 49 days, and then on the 50th is the celebration festival. That's where Pentecost comes from. And it happens to be the day that this event happens. But we know on Passover in this particular year was the day that Jesus was crucified, was buried, and rose from the dead. And then he spent 40 days with his disciples on earth before ascending to heaven. So 50 minus 40 leaves us with 10, with this 10-day period of waiting. And not only are the apostles waiting, but they know sort of what they're waiting for. And it it comes to us in the first chapter of Acts as Jesus appears to the disciples before ascending into heaven and he says, stay in Jerusalem and wait until the Holy Spirit comes and then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. But they're told to wait in Jerusalem until the day when sort of their, their mission, when they're sent out to do this work of sharing the gospel. That sounds like an easy thing to do, right? Just sit and wait and wait for this to happen. But the place where they're sitting and waiting is Jerusalem. It's a city that's 
not safe. There's got to be anxiety for these apostles. It's the city in which Jesus was crucified. The city in which the apostles, the disciples scatter after the crucifixion. When, when Peter is, is warming his hands by the fire, the woman says, you, you were one of them. You were, you were with that guy, right? And Peter denies him. It's scary. It's dangerous. So this 10-day period of waiting for the apostles has to be a time when they're thinking, man, when's this going to happen? What are we going to do in the meantime? What? We can't go out on the street. We've got to hunker down. And all the thoughts start churning and, and the anxieties and the managing of expectations. But the key is this. They're gathered together. They're waiting. They're obedient to what Jesus has called them to do. And they wait in the city in Jerusalem until this day comes. And we hear about this event This coming of the Holy Spirit, as they're gathered together, this wind breaks into the room, and it's not just a a little breeze or, like, did somebody leave a window open kind of wind? It's violent, the Bible tells us. And I have to wonder about the apostles' thinking in that 10-day period. So Jesus told them the Holy Spirit's going to come. So I wonder if they, you know, at one point were like, I, I wonder if it'll be like the hair on the back of my neck will stand up. Or, or maybe, like, the clouds will peel back and there'll be a vision. Like, what, what's going to happen on that day? Is it going to be a small thing or a big thing? How will we know that it's the Holy Spirit? Well, as we find out on the day of Pentecost, there's no doubt that this is that day that the Holy Spirit has come. It's a violent wind. It's fire that descends upon them. And they speak. And everybody hears the wonders of God in their own language. There's no doubt that this is the day that Jesus promised would come that this event had happened. And as we look at this event, this 10 days of waiting, we realize that this is a day that was long coming more than just these 10 days, just this week and a half. This is a day that had been waited upon really since uh, much earlier in the story of the Bible and our relationship with God. So if we kind of zoom back and we look at it and place Pentecost in its timeline of of our relationship with the Lord. Let's go all the way back to the garden. So Adam and Eve are with God in the cool of the garden. They walk with him. They talk with him, right? Many great hymns and songs written about this relationship where they are face to face with God. So there's no need of them waiting for him to arrive because they're there with him. But we know what happens as they sin and as we fall from God's grace, they're sent out. They're sent on their way to go out into the world and and enter into this life of seasons of waiting, of anxiety, of managing expectations. And as the people of God, we go, and then we get to the flood and Noah's Ark. We, most of us know that story from Sunday school, right? But immediately following that, God tells us, he gives us a command. He says, go and fill the earth, multiply. And what do we do? We obey, right? We do exactly as God tells us. Until, very shortly after that, we get to a place that really looks nice. We're wandering along and uh, maybe had the best of intentions of fulfilling this command, but we find this place called Shinar and we say, hey, this looks like a nice place to camp out. Let's stay here. And let's, while we're at it, build a tower and let's make bricks that will last forever. And while we're building this tower for ourselves, we'll make a name for ourselves. But in so doing, they're doing exactly the opposite of what God commanded them to do. And they build this tower, the tower called Babel. And so God confuses their language. And he scatters them. He sends them out. And as he sends them out, it's like a farmer scattering seed on a field to be planted. And we're sent with confused language out into the corners of the earth. And this season lasts until Pentecost comes. And Pentecost, where our language was scattered at Babel, it's unified at Pentecost. All the nations under heaven hear and, and understand the wonders of God. So our languages are brought back together. People are brought back together. We're all together in the city of Jerusalem. And then the church is formed. And the important point in all of this is that for us, Pentecost wasn't just a day or an afternoon or this one event where the Holy Spirit came and people spoke and this cool thing happened. Pentecost is a season that we are still in ourselves. And just as from Babel to Pentecost, we waited for the coming of the Holy Spirit, we, with the Holy Spirit upon us, now wait for the next season. 
And I believe that season is described beautifully in Revelation in chapter 7. As every tribe, every nation, every tongue gathers together in worship before the throne of the Lord. So as a church, we're gathered together in this season of waiting. And Pentecost, by the way, being the harvest festival, is the season when God harvests his church, gathers it together. And under all of this, as scripture proclaims, as we look at these seasons and as we look at Pentecost, God is faithful to fulfill his promises, just as he did for the apostles. And that fulfillment will far surpass any expectation or anticipation or anxiety that we can drum up in the waiting. But the key is it all happens in his time, in his timing. So all of that is good, foundational, comforting, biblical truth that we stand upon. But what do we do when we wake up tomorrow morning? And we find ourselves still in these seasons of waiting, waiting for a phone call, waiting for a test result. We have so many people here that are celebrating graduations, the end of a, of a chapter, graduating high school, graduating college. And as that season, that day, that event comes and the calendar clicks down to zero and uh, all of our expectations are met, the next season starts, a career, college, whatever, and then it's a season after season. So what do we do in, in these seasons of our life of unknowns? I shared, um, some of you, you may know, um, my mom has been sick for the last year and um, she's doing well now, she's in remission, but it's been a season, a uh, little over, just about a year and a half, that I've walked alongside of her and it's been a series of seasons of waiting, anticipation, what's next, what's next. When she originally got sick, we didn't know what was happening, and so she went to the emergency room. And in that evening, it was like, what's going on? So we're waiting for the doctor to come in. All the scenarios playing out in our minds, what could it be, what's, what's next? And then a diagnosis comes, and it's a cancer diagnosis, and it's like, okay, well, what now? The next test, the next treatment. And then another season gives way to another season of waiting. And in our lives, it's permeated with these seasons of what's next, what's next? And all throughout, that temptation is there to play out the scenarios in our head, to turn inward, to expect the worst, perhaps, or to isolate ourselves. But I believe the apostles are the example that we need to cling to in the seasons of life of waiting. The apostles that gather together, that trust in Jesus, that Jesus who told them to stay in Jerusalem, that they would be safe or they would be protected or this Holy Spirit would come if they were obedient and together. So as we ask ourselves in the seasons of waiting, what do we do with all the unknowns, the unknown timelines, the expectations of what's going to happen when we anxiously struggle to manage our expectations? And I believe the truth is this. We simply gather together. Gather and trust in the promises of the Lord. To be connected. And sometimes it's as simple as being in worship, being in a community group, going on mission trips, serving in the soup kitchen, going to Bible study, whatever it is, being part of the body as the body was formed and harvested and gathered on Pentecost. That is the calling for us, is to lean into the body of Christ and to be together, to reach out to one another, to say, hey, let's get lunch this week. I'm having a tough time. I've got a lot going on in my mind. Let's be together. To trust and to lean into the body and to know that God is faithful and fulfills his promises and that the fulfillment of those promises will far succeed, exceed our expectations as the Holy Spirit comes upon us. But the key is that it happens in his time and it's for us to be gathered together. That is what it means to be in the season of Pentecost, my friends. Amen. In a few moments, we're going to have an opportunity to respond to Joel's message with our tithes and offering. We're going to pass the uh, baskets back and forth, and as they come past you, we encourage you to put your connection card into that basket.
If you're online with us, there's a link above the live feed through which you can make your donation. If you'd like to text to give, dial 757-530-5683 and type the word give. Once the plate has come down the aisle, if you're motivated to uh, make a financial commitment to the church, there's a table over here. As you exit the sanctuary, you can put your commitment cards on that table. Let's continue to worship God by the giving of our tithes and offerings. from you, bless others with these donations and tithes that you have blessed us with. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 
Let's remain standing as we proclaim what we believe by responding together with the Apostles' Creed. Christian, what do you believe? In response to all that we've experienced this morning, the music, the prayers, the message, scripture, we have an opportunity to go to God and provide our concerns and lay them at his feet. As we do so, we're going to be mindful of the world in which we live, and we're going to be asking for peace in various parts of the world, be it Gaza, Israel, or the Ukraine. In terms of our nation, we're going to ask for protection for those who serve our nation, for those who are deployed, though currently serving overseas. When we think about our cities, we're going to be mindful of those students and teachers who are wrapping up their school year, especially those graduating from high school and college in the next few days. Focusing on our church, we're going to be mindful of those who continue to be committed to the gratitude journals for the Pentecost prayer service today at 1215 in First Hall for the Afghan Dinner and Resettlement Fundraiser this evening at 5.30 at First Lutheran Church. We're gonna keep Chris McKinnon Hing and her husband Zach and parents Pat and Colin in our prayers, as we will also Tom and Lynn Jones. This past week, we received 106 prayer requests through our connection cards, 37 for healing, 13 for friends and family, 13 praises, that said, let's pray. Lord God, by your grace and with your mercy, we approach you today at this time and in this place to lay before you the concerns that we carry within us, on our hearts, in our minds, the joys that we experience, the burdens we have, those that we've shared with others, those that we've kept to ourselves, those that we wonder about, and those that we brag about. We ask in all of these things as we mention these concerns for nation and this world and this city and this church, that you would lift them before yourself and deal with our concerns, calm our hearts, bring us peace. This we pray in your Son's name, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father.
worshiping with us for the first time. We're so glad that you're with us, and we have a gift for you. It's a small book by Rick Warren called What on Earth Am I Here For? You'll find it in the narthex on a table as you leave out that way, or if you come through these doors where there's coffee and donuts, uh, there's a table all the way through in the commons, and that is available for you. Our prayer team has been praying with and for us throughout the service, and they'll be here um, forward in the transept on this side. If you have something you'd like to lift up in prayer, please come forward and, uh, and share that with them. Consider coming to the prayer lunch this afternoon, just following this service. Uh, if you go through the doors that way and follow around um, and gather together and be in prayer on this Pentecost Sunday. And as you go out into the seasons of waiting, of managing expectations, of anxiety, whatever it may be, remember that the call for us is to gather together, to trust and to obey, and to receive and welcome the Holy Spirit in our lives as we are together as the church in this season of harvest. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.